my question is, what do you feel it would take for the women to leave the cult and take their children with them? Oh, that's such a hard question. I would say it's it's very individual. Mm-hmm. It would take their own belief system being shattered. You can't force someone to see it for themselves, and you can't force someone to want it for themselves. They have to find it for themselves. Like, my mom left. Like, we got her to leave with the kids, and six months later, she went back. And, like, I remember beating myself up. Like, what could I have done more? And, like, I, I was taking the responsibility too much on myself when I don't have control over what where she's at. And I always go back to that, was it a Mark Twain quote where it's, like, it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they've been fooled. Because mm-hmm. I think it's a pride thing. Like, my, what's my mom going to do? Believe that her entire life was a lie? That's really hard to do. It <laughs> is. so hard, especially if you're not, yeah, if you're not ready. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't have to, like, physically leave anything like you guys did. Um, but you did have to take your kids out and like it was like leaving a situation that you were raised in your whole and, life and disappointing a lot of people mm-hmm. I always say like I'd much rather have someone be furious at me than to be disappointed and I mm-hmm. think when you leave the LDS church it's the disappointment that's the hard part like more than like like I said seriously I w- wish that people would just be like mad um, mm-hmm. more than the disappointment or like knowing that they're like praying hard for you to come back all the time or that you're on the temple rolls which is where you'd like write people's names yeah. for them to pray for in the temple and I mean now I've gotten to the point where I'm like you know you can bring me all the cookies and pray for me all you want I am super happy like with yeah. extra prayers like I'll take extra prayers any day but like it's a disappointment part of it that makes it a little bit like mm-hmm. tougher to be able to separate but I think you're right that like nobody can ever like when Sam and I when we had our journey You know, I tried to not really ever share much of that journey with anyone else because I was like, I don't ever want to be the reason that somebody else leaves unless they're coming and asking questions. Mm -hmm. Because if they have, if they already have their own stuff, then Mm -hmm. that then maybe I could be a resource for them. So like letting people know that I can be a resource without anyone ever feeling like I'm trying to spout off stuff. Because when you learn things for yourself in whatever religion or group or cult or whatever it is. No matter what, if you just go and you start spouting off everything, no one's going to be able to take that in. Right. It's and true. And so, you know, at this point, I, I had a conversation with my mom recently who is still active LDS. And um, I think I said, I was like, well, yeah, but you at least know why I left though, right? And she was like, not really. And it's been a couple of years now and her and I have had like some good talks and stuff. And I was like, like if one of your friends asked you like, hey, why did your daughter leave the LDS church? You would be able to give them an answer. And she said, no. And I realized it's because in every conversation I've had with her, I've shared like little things that I thought that she could handle without me ever wanting to hurt her. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that actually makes sense. Like I've been sharing, you know, when a conversation would come up about a specific topic, I would give like a tiny little breadcrumb would be like, oh, this is how I feel about that mm-hmm. one topic without ever giving the full picture because right. I was scared of hurting her. Yeah. And so I was like, well, are you ready to hear now so that you at least have that for yourself? and you know my reasons, and she said yes, and we're able to have an awesome conversation and be open and vulnerable about that. But I know that like when it was first happening, the pain of me leaving was so much that she wasn't ready for that answer. Mm -hmm. She would not have been okay for me to share even a very simplified version, like Mm -hmm. a wrapped up in the present version of why I was leaving. She wasn't, she wouldn't have been ready for that a couple years ago. That's very similar to like, but I think I, when I left, I did try to like make my mom understand. I'm like, mom, like, I don't want to marry my cousin. I don't want to live the life that you live. You're not even happy. Like, but it's, it, the same thing happened. Like she didn't understand. It was too much for her. It's almost like you're talking a different language to yeah. them. And then, so, yeah. But I guess the answer, answer to that question is you, you're you the example, right? You you left because you knew for yourself it wasn't what you wanted. You didn't believe in it. Your kids, you didn't want that. So at the end of the day, the person has to find it for themselves. I think it's a lot harder, sadly, for the women who already have kids because they have all that pressure. My mom, the reason why she went back is because they were saying, oh, you're really going to take heaven from your kids, too. So mm-hmm. it's like, at the end of the day, um, they have to really, really, really believe it. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, you do. You have to just find it for yourself. My mom doesn't even want to hear things because she's still in. Do you have a relationship with your mom? It's very, it's very like, strained. Um, I can talk to her sometimes, but she gets in trouble if she talks to me and they move her every time I find out where she oh. lives. That being said, I did find out where she lived. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> so they might they might move her. It's fine. I'll find her again. I do every time. At this point, it's just a part of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think 
one thing that's awesome that I love that like you have a YouTube channel and that you're on social media and sharing too is I feel like um, I've heard like rumors of some of Sam's sisters and people like that are on the outside that have started watching Mm -hmm. and those type of things. And I'm like, kind of goes back to the, if someone was to leave the Kingston group, they know that you're a resource there for them. When they're ready to hear those things, Mm -hmm. they know, okay, I can go and start watching those YouTube videos and see what she's really saying. Like when people are ready to hear those type of things, if they know that they have access to right. those people, I think like that's that huge. That, that's a big reason why I started my YouTube channel. It was like two years ago that I started. But like I was on the show like 18 years old. I was like literally less than a year. I was like contacted by producers and I was like, yep, let's do this. Because it was like the second you leave, and maybe this is similar in the FLDS, they paint out a story of your story. And that's the story in the cult that they get to hear about you, whatever it is. And so I was like, I want, first of all, the truth to be out there. And second of all, them to know that there's a life outside. Yeah. Like, and that's why I feel like the YouTubes really helps to be like, look, this is what's happening right now. This is the truth. So like you and just like that, they don't have to listen if they don't want to. But the ones that are ready are going to like growing up in polygamy. <laughs> We're going to go find it. OK, that is crazy because I was also I was 17 and I was also contacted through holding out help really? to be on the Escaping Polygamy show. And I turned it down. Because I didn't know the truth about Warren. I didn't know. I just left because I wanted a better life. Oh, did you still kind of believe in Warren when you left? No, I did not. But I did not know the truth of him. Yeah. At this point, I was like, you know what? I just, I want my own life. I want my own stuff. I want to choose who I can marry. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I don't believe that he is right for me. I I still believe that he was probably a leader and still a prophet to some. Mm -hmm. But I believe that everyone saves themselves and you do that through whether it's the religion you believe in or your self-beliefs. But for me, it just wasn't, it wasn't right for me. And so I turned it down. I was like, no, I'm I'm just going to do it silently. I don't want to hurt my family. I don't want to. And I was very catered to the people that were in. Yep. And there was a million stories going on. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know the small town. Oh, yeah. It is, the rumor being, being in a cult is like a small town. Everybody knows everything and then some about you. You're like, wait, wait, can you tell me about that? I didn't even know that I did that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Everybody, everybody's got their stories, that's for sure. <laughs> um, oh, this one's sweet. Just said, excited about the women's panel. All the questions I read in the comment section here are good ones. Can't wait to see the video. Um... Obviously, just as much as y'all are comfortable sharing on the topic from Sophie Norman says, how are your relationships with your parents and family since leaving or taking a step back from the religions? Um, I actually just did a podcast episode um, about this on my podcast. Cult- we'll link it. Cult- we'll Crew podcast. It. Go watch it. Yeah, go watch um, it. We'll link it. Episode five, if you want to like know more about this in depth, I just recently realized that I was just like that putting so much on myself, like it's my responsibility to get them out and I need to be there for them. And um, I realized that the whole relationship was, my mom would call me only when she wanted to. I wasn't allowed to come home for holidays. Like I, I was so available for her and ready for her to just slam the door in my face all the time. The rejection was like a normal thing. And I got to the point where I was like, I would never have a friend in my life treat me as negative and poor as my family have treated me and keep welcoming them in my life and giving them all this energy and support and not getting anything back. So I just like last week actually was like, I'm not cutting you off, mom. I love you, but I need to put this boundary up and protect myself the way you never did. Because there was things that happened as a child that she could have protected me from and she didn't. And she even put me in harm's way, never like apologized for it, never acknowledged it, and then expects me to be there for her when she needs me. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I put her in this, like, it sounds sad and I still feel kind of guilty for it, but at the same time I feel freed from it a little bit. Like, she's now an acquaintance when she's ready to apologize and ready to be like, look, I'm going to give you the same respect that you've given me these years, you know, and we can have that relationship. But for the past eight years, I was like, slap me in the face. I don't care. Like, I want to be a part of my family, but it's like, they don't want, if they don't want me, then I'm not going to force myself into it. I guess that's interesting because for me, it's kind of a little bit the same. However... I think my mom has driven me to a lot of like, you know, that's the reason I want to be successful is, I mean, mm-hmm. I, for myself, obviously, but I want to, you know, help her out. And, but to at the same time, to be able to take care of that. I had that same thing, but it's also your mom. It's just like that. They're moving her around. You don't yeah. know where she's at. My mom recently like wouldn't tell me where she's living. And I'm like, it's so hard to be your daughter. <laughs> but like now my goal is to match the energy like yeah. that mm-hmm. if you want to call me you know how to contact me i will i reach out sometimes mm-hmm. but now it's like i don't i don't give her money anymore um mm-hmm. 
I will honestly, if she desperately needed it, I know I still would. Yeah. Believe it or not, Do, because I love she, her. Um, does she answer your phone calls, or is it usually all, only on her terms? She answers them off and on, but usually yeah. yes. So that is a good thing. And I do know she loves me. She expresses that. And I know, like, she has bipolar. And so she feels like she cannot support herself, which is, I think, why she's still in. Honestly. I, I hate diagnosing my mom, but I feel like my mom has bipolar. But I think it really is just, like, she's this one person that really wants to love her kids and be a good mom. And then there's the cult version of her that she needs to, like, abide by. And so that feels that's, bipolar. Yeah, that's my mom. She was actually diagnosed, though. Really? Yes. Did they go to the doctors and do that? When she was way younger, yes. Oh, so it was okay. probably back in the 90s. And then later, we had like our own doctors and our own ways of healing. And it was mm-hmm. essential oils and prayers, not as yeah. much medication. Essential oils. <laughs> <laughs> we got doctors. We were... mm-hmm. But we That's did, yes. I, we did still, like if there was anything severe, like we did use doctors still. Okay. So but then... a lot, they tried to cut it more as, you know, they would appoint people to go get the doctors or mm-hmm. degree and stuff and they would try to keep it in the cult same with the police everything they tried to keep everything in the community yeah that's... so we had midwives and stuff that were in the community yep. that's very similar with us then so then with your mom though you're not allowed to come home for christmas you're not welcome for holidays oh we don't do christmas we don't do oh, holidays. We don't do holidays. oh yeah i forgot <laughs> thanksgiving fourth of july uh fourth of july here Easter. and there but not really um we were actually told to not watch fireworks for a long time. Like, I'd sneak outside and watch the fireworks because they were bad. Because they would spark a light in your brain maybe. <laughs> or something, yeah. But uh, Thanksgiving, we always did kind of believe in, but it was very different. We had to eat fish for Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. And this was something Warren actually changed. So he told us to eat fish, certain foods for Thanksgiving. We could not have turkey, which is crazy. Turkey is delicious. It's Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, they did believe in Thanksgiving, but that is about it. And it was a time of thanking the Lord for his blessings. And right. it was all about religion. It was, it was not. Thing, though, yes. Right? So it was just the, the family. The four years that you've been out, have you been able to participate? Or no. 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 Oh, okay. So it's very similar to my relationship with my mom then. <laughs> yeah. What about with you then? Because you chose to leave. Yeah. So for my family, it was split because my dad had come out as an atheist a couple of years before we... Well, like four or five years before, so quite a bit ways before. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he was thrilled. My mom is still active, so she was really hurt. It was really hard. And they're still married. They still are married. They're actually doing. I know everyone says that. Uh, It took a lot of work and the almost divorce a couple times where they got really close. Um, But they're actually doing really, really well right now. And she's still active. And she's still active, and he's still atheist, and they've figured it out and worked it out and doing a lot better. So. They're doing great now, um, but they, so, and then it was really, really hard on my mom, and it's definitely, like, baby steps talking mm-hmm. to her more and more, and I feel like now her and I have gotten to a place where I can be a lot more open and honest with her about how I feel, which has made a huge difference for me, um, but I would say that it's, I mean, it's been, like, three years since we have been, like, completely out, almost three years, mm-hmm. so it definitely has taken time. Um, Sam's family it was really 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 hard on them <laughs> the, do- the adoptive family that like helped introduce him to the LDS oh. that was very hard but I feel like now over time like we've gotten into a good place with them too so we were really lucky it definitely it didn't ruin any relationships it strained some relationships mm-hmm. definitely put a lot of pressure on some relationships um but overall I think yeah just the overall time and then realizing that we weren't gonna like change as people because I know and, and we could totally understand because we had had friends and family that had left when we were still fully believing and it always seemed like they would like change so much or you just felt like uncomfortable around it. Like, I don't know. It just felt like there was this like, huge divide. And so when we left, we knew we did not want it to be like that. We did not want anyone to feel uncomfortable with our presence or do things that would make them feel uncomfortable or we just wanted them to realize like we are the same people. We just now have a different belief than you and mm-hmm. having different beliefs than other people is normal and fine yeah it doesn't need <laughs> it doesn't need to be a scary thing right mm-hmm. um and most people on a daily basis are not talking about their spiritual beliefs yeah <laughs> in utah know? though they are well, <laughs> that's true in utah is and in really active homes they do as well but mm-hmm. we also let them know like if we're in your house like you don't have to feel like you can't pray around it. like yeah. you're more than happy to be there for for family prayers like prayers don't offend us you don't need to be worried about talking about how church was like we get that we feel that we understand that Mm -hmm. and so I think once all of our family members realized that like they didn't have to 
do something differently to make us feel comfortable and we weren't going to do anything differently to have to make them feel comfortable and everything could be Mm -hmm. pretty normal um that's definitely made a big difference but it definitely took a lot of like them realizing that because I've seen a lot of the other ways you see a lot of people that I don't know change a lot Mm -hmm. but not necessarily for the worst okay this one next Mm. this was someone asked you on your yes okay yes so um would love to hear you ladies talk about how has the perception of your body and relationship to modesty and sexuality changed since leaving that's a really, really good question. I'm guys. really interested in your answer because of the you had to wear the dresses and they all had to be homemade. Yeah, right? I think you should start doing on that one. Um, I think uh, well, a lot has changed honestly. Um, I I always hated the dresses even when I was there. Like I said, I was a re- I was a rebellious kid. My mom went through hell with me. Um, <laughs> but since I've left, I guess I went through a phase of insecurity about like my body and sex in general because we were taught it was bad. Mm -hmm. Like any sexual relations, even kissing before marriage is bad and restricted. So I went through a phase where, you know, I dated someone for a long time, was committed and I was 100% in. And then when we started having problems in the relationship, I started seeking attention from other people because of these insecurities. Mm -hmm. And so I went through a phase where I kissed a lot of people. And then I kind of took back what now I consider is a power and it's, it's, uh, how do you say it's it's kind of sacred to me now i choose like you know how i can dress mm-hmm. i choose to dress you know how you're comfortable how i'm comfortable and that isn't like i went through what you could consider a slutty phase where i liked wearing very like revealing clothes because it was fun and i'm not against that but now i choose to be a little more just because that's the way i want people to respect me and see me and my sexual relations um are very sacred to me yeah they're just for me and whoever i choose yeah. And I went through a hard period and I lost a lot of people because of that period of not mm-hmm. respecting relationships. So now for me, it's sacred. It's my power. And I choose the way yeah. people see me, the way I live my sex life, and the way I dress. Yeah. That's I feel good. like I feel like it's it seems like, and this is just an outsider's opinion, so you have to tell me if it's true or not. But I see like a lot of times when women first leave the FLDS that they do they almost have to go to that other extreme to be able to find their happy middle ground. And I feel like that happens in a lot, like not just like sexually or modestly, but I feel like you see that a lot when anyone leaves like one extreme, it's so common that they (laughs) gotta go to the other extreme and then they realize that like, okay, wait, I can find this happy middle of like where I actually want to be. Mm -hmm. But when you leave one, you want the complete freedom. And I remember talking to um, somebody else that had left FLDS and it kind of broke my heart a little bit, but I can also understand, you know, she said, you know, when you're leaving and you have like no sex education, she goes, I didn't know that people on the outside who were told were evil and whores and all these awful things about anybody who's on the outside. She goes, I didn't know when I started dating that it wasn't normal to have sex on every first date. Same for me, me and my first boyfriend, we didn't have sex for eight months of our relationship. Eight think, months. Yeah. I yeah. think a lot so, of us go through, and that's why, I think I was talking to you guys about this earlier, um, it's very common in, you see in ex-FLDS, ex-order members, even ex-AUB, like AUB, women will get pregnant really quick. Because they also, I, I kind of, I, I like to look at the psychological side of it too, because we all have daddy issues, because we didn't <laughs> have a very prominent father figure, and we also had the father figure we had, um, I mean, I don't, I, maybe I'm not going to speak for you, but f- as far as for me, uh, and I don't know, you, you had three moms too. Yeah. And real dad was kicked out. Stepdad yeah. was kicked out. Very many so <laughs> issues. For me, it was like the only man in, that I was allowed to have in my life, right? Cause we weren't allowed to kiss. We weren't allowed to have any relations till you're married and your father's supposed to be the one to help you find that person. He was this person that said, this is what a relationship looks like. He put my mom down. He was not a very good father or a good uh, husband. So then I would gravitate towards those red flags. And then I think that I'm just like, I'm just going to generalize people that come from cults, women that come from cults that don't get the therapy and the help. They fall into a, this pattern of running to those red flags. And then they, mm. with that, with the no sex education, they get pregnant and they get stuck with these shady guys. And another thing is, for me, like, you know, we were still in and that's why we didn't have sex for eight months. But as soon as we left 
every single person that I had got to know would be like, everybody has sex on the first date. So even if I didn't feel comfortable with it, I would be insecure and I'd be like, mm-hmm. okay, if I don't give him sex, he's not going to stick around. Yep. yep. And yeah. and it's a, it's a, I think it's something that's internal, especially when you don't know yourself. And so you feel like um, you have to like go with the crowd. Same, same with when you're in the cult, you're going with that crowd. Yeah. Then you come out here and you're like, if this is the norm, okay. And then you're like, but I'm not happy doing either of those. Well, but it's and, like and now, then you like, realize that like most normal people, that is not the norm actually, yep. right? Mm-hmm. But because you guys only see like the extreme of the other side where you're told that everybody is evil and doing all these awful things all the time, it's so easy for them to fall into the trap of like, well, everyone said that everyone's partying and drinking and doing drugs and sleeping around all the time. That's what the outside world looks like. Mm -hmm. So you don't realize like most people in the middle, no, you don't have sex on every first date. And I'm like, but I can totally see how they fall into that trap so easily. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, at least for me, because you know, I'm definitely an exception to this rule. Like, nope, had, you know, great dad, no issues there. Just normal (laughs) marriage. Like, um, I'm super, super lucky in that sense. But whenever I see these girls, like, come out now, I told Sam recently, I was like, you know, I had never thought before to kind of maybe mention and help those women know what more normal looks like. Because you think, like, when you've grown up in the real world, you just assume some things that, like, everybody would know, like, normal dating norms. Like, Mm -hmm. I would never think of, like, oh, if someone comes out, yeah, we've, like, helped people talk about finances and, like, getting cars and helping them get on their feet, like, financially and finding jobs and things like that. I was like, we might need to start like talking to people more about what is normal and what is not in the dating mm-hmm. scene because it yeah. seems Definitely, like a lot yes. of women are taken advantage mm-hmm. of because they don't know because they don't yep. know that they can access contraceptives, let alone the fact that they can contraceptives for free. Yep. I want to do a whole video on that because in Utah, you can go to Planned Parenthood and yes. get free birth control. I, yeah. I would love to be on that because that was mm-hmm. one thing for me. Uh, but now I think like it took me a long time to get to that stage, but now like in the relationship I'm in. I don't think we had sex for a whole month mm-hmm. at first. Just because I was like, you know what? I'm doing this for me. I'm taking it at my pace. I'm not ready for anything serious. I'm just going to relax. Mm-hmm. And I think people should be more like that where it's like, I'm, I'm not going to say don't have sex if you don't want to. But I, in my experience, healthy relationships come from getting to know each other mm-hmm. first. It's also it's before consensual. getting to know them. As yeah. long as it's consensual whatever you want it to be, but you just have to make sure that it's not, that people understand um, what consent actually is. Yep. Yes. What consent actually is and that it's actually something that you're comfortable for, like comfortable with and that it's something that you're doing, like you said, not because of daddy issues, but Mm -hmm. trying to recognize in yourself like where I think the biggest thing, and for me, because I was married for seven years, right? I think that the biggest thing, because I realized that it was that I did not know myself. So how can you have a relationship with someone and have them know you and love you if you don't know yourself and love yourself? So then it starts to be like, I don't think anyone should be in a relationship, a serious one, or honestly any relationship if you don't know yourself. Because what are you looking for? If you don't know what you, who you are, you don't know what you're looking for. That is yeah. a big thing. And another thing I want to address is like, obviously everybody take it at your own pace. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but yes, I think uh, for me, as soon as I got my self-confidence, I didn't want exterior validation. I didn't Mm -hmm. want sex for validation. I I didn't need that. It just kind of fell off and it wasn't Mm -hmm. even a thing anymore. And so I think just that, like you said, the healthy relation with yourself is where it needs to start. Yeah. I think that that's what it all boils down to. And all the problems will solve. doesn't matter when you decide Mm -hmm. to have sex in your relationship. All those problems won't exist because you know who you are inside. Exactly. What was the question? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Um... I, did we uh, answer it? <laughs> did, we, did we answer the question? Uh, I think we did. I guess bodies, right? We yeah, started, bodies okay, and sexuality yeah, yeah. and how that's changed as you left. I think we got that one. Um, I'm going to... We are, of course, going longer than what we expected, which is also kind of what we expected. So I'll just kind of do... Um, kind of go through here. Oh, here. What's, what are some of the things that aren't bad about how you were raised that are traditions you'll want to continue with your own kids? Hmm. I think my work ethic. Yeah. That is something that helped me to be able to attack the outside world was because I was work. Well, I'm not going to make my kids work at five years old. I am not either. (laughs) But I will definitely, I'm not going to um, just give them, you know, like, uh, like I want them to be able to know the value of work for sure. But definitely there's a lot more that I'm not going to bring from my childhood and, you know. Oh, for sure. (laughs) I think another thing is like, I'm a really good cook because I've been cooking since I was five. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. FLDS girls, 
we did not get that trait. Like, I can barely cook like a microwave meal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but oh, no, I, I, young I can do the 10 yards. Learned, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Selling. I love that. I embrace that. In fact, I always try to find things mm-hmm. about my past that I can celebrate because it helps me accept me. Yeah. yeah. So there are good and there are bad. Yeah, that's that's good. I guess I maybe I should look more at the um, the positive sides. I did like that we. I mean, when I was considered a part of the family, we were very close. Yeah. So that would be something. the biggest thing from the LDS that I would mm-hmm. say is like the emphasis and the importance on family and family home evenings and family time and the emphasis on family definitely something mm-hmm. that we hold on to. We I, still have family night. Like it doesn't have to be on Mondays. Like not as strictly as like LDS, but we call it family date night, and we try to go on a family date night with our kids and. Let them choose where we're going to go out to eat and, like, activities and stuff. And, you know, we may not do, like, scripture time at the beginning or, like, a talk, like, in the LDS, but the family time and, like, having that night every single week, we still continue that on and love it. Yeah. I guess another one for me would be uh, I love that I feel like that I could be a mom. Like, I can take care of a kid. I can take Mm -hmm. care of an infant. I've been doing it since I was seven. Yep. (laughs) And... It was a lot of responsibility. I hated it while doing it. I have eight younger siblings, mm-hmm. but I love that I have that knowledge. That's funny. And that You're, confidence. You have three moms. I have eight younger siblings. My mom had 10 kids. My mom had eight. Oh, okay. So you were the oldest. No. Wait, what? So that's three siblings from both. From the oh, three like moms. Oh, halves. Oh, yes. okay, okay, okay. I so I like, have three younger than me from my mom. Okay. And then the other mom had twins you know, a couple boys. So in all, there was eight younger than me. Okay, okay. Hmm, that's cool. But no, I was I was one of the younger ones. Yeah. So. so that's one thing we all have in common is the, the family. The family, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very family close. <laughs> um, if women in the groups weren't able to get pregnant, what would happen to them? I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's different with the two of us, but for us, it was definitely, I've talked about this before, you are treated like a broken tool. Like, you have one job and you can't mm. even do that. So there was times where they would have the women go, like, basically go try to get treatments or something, like fix the brokenness that you are. And a lot of times when it was the man's fault, they still would blame the woman. Like, they would just assume it was the woman's ovaries or something. So mm. then they're treated like a broken tool. You'll see the husband go around less and less because, well, what's the point, you know? And then they kind of are just... First to side? Yep. That is so sad. I think for me, uh, they weren't really considered broken, but they did go through a lot of treatments. So yes, kind of, I guess, I mean, they made them go through their fertility treatments and all of that to try and have children. But like my aunt, she passed away from cancer in 2020, uh, October, but she was never, she could never have children. So she became a nurse. A nurse? Okay. So she found her calling, I guess, somewhere else. But um, I guess I uh, wonder if you guys had this in common where they would feel very guilty, the women would. Like, they did something wrong. Yes, they did. In fact, that was normal. They were always like, why would God not allow me to have children? Like, did I do something wrong? That was, yes, that was very normal. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was ever, like, abused or, like, you can't have kids because of that. They tried to stay away from blame. Yeah. But the women inside, because that is our only purpose in life, is to bring more souls into this world and raise them in the gospel, you do. You feel very broken when you can't have children. I I wonder, too, if that's because you guys also grew up being like what a what a blessing to be a mother in zion right (laughs) yeah it's very very um definitely not church shamed at all like and it's never really like i think the the lds church again with it being that they're like very progressive um you'll get to have children in the next life basically is what you taught that is given hope as far as that goes and that um yeah it's definitely looked at completely medically Mm -hmm. It was never a, you did something wrong, you don't deserve children, nothing like that. Um, It definitely still was, like, absolutely heartbreaking because most people, most women in the LDS, like, yeah, they do value that part. They've been told their entire lives how being a mother is so important and that experience on this earth. And so, um, but again, they have access to medical treatment, so a lot of women do go and get the treatment and end up having children anyway or... The um, LDS Church also started an adoption agency, so there's a lot of LDS adoptions oh, wow. because they had their complete own agency to be able to help women. So I'd say when it came to that, I I wouldn't say there was any shame put by the church itself mm-hmm. onto women. Women obviously felt sad and heartbroken if they weren't able to fulfill it, but 
I wouldn't consider there being any shame from the church. I have a question for you. Did you guys believe in selling children to parents as well if you adopt a child, selling the child to the parent? Absolutely. Because we believed in that as well. Yep, that was the only time that children were in the temple before they were adults is to be sealed to their parents. Wow. So, yeah, if there were any adoptions, then they would go in, they'd get to be sealed, and yeah, that was the thing. Yeah, we believed that as well. So I think that helped some women cope with it. Like, if you can adopt a child and have it sold to you, that is your child. Yeah, exa exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. It wasn't, yeah, adoption was very, is very common. It's also very common for, like, um, LDS teenagers, if they do get pregnant, it's very common for them to use the adoption agency and have wow. um, children be adopted out, rather than, like, obviously they don't believe in abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's part of, like, going into the adoption agency where, like, since they don't have abortions, mm -hmm. then, you know, if you are a teenager and you're not ready for that or decide not to have your child, then you put them up with the Mormon adoption agency. And I'm then they go to other Mormon families. that you said abortion. I'm wondering if this question's Hot under. topic. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, this one, this one probably won't be that big of a deal because it's, it's way less than abortion. Even uh, condoms and, and contraceptive, was that a no-no? For me, yes, very much. Mm -hmm. Any sort of <clears throat> birth prevention was considered murder of unborn. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we were taught, and it was like, uh, I remember giving, so my sister got married in the group, she ended up leaving and getting divorced, but I came to her, like, secret bachelorette party, and I brought condoms, because I, I thought that was, like, a funny thing to give her, and when my half-brother found out, he, he, like, kind of scolded me, and was, like, in a joking way, but in kind of serious way, it was like, I should just poke con poke holes in these condoms so that I can tell the kids that you're here because of me. And he thought it was so funny, but it was also like, very like, no, no, you don't talk about that. If you're, if you're married and using condoms, mm -hmm. why, you know? I have another question. Was self-gratification like bad? Self-gratification. Masturbation. Like oh. masturbation, sorry. <laughs> I was like, what? I can't yes. <laughs> um, I just remember like, I didn't even really have the tampon talk or like, well, they would say oh, like, neither it, did we. <laughs> when, when I tried to go get a tampon out of my mom's room, like she would have this, she was talking about the hymen, how like, if you break the hymen, that's like your virginity. And mm -hmm. I was like, what? <laughs> and it's like your husband's gift. Like who, who cares? But like, so that was weird. And then also it was like, you would, I, I just remember feeling very ashamed, even like when I would shower, like I would be very quick with the private area of, if I'm going to be cleaning myself. Like, I felt like I didn't even have control over my own body because of the way that they made us feel so shameful and so sexualized. For us, it was bad to even look at our naked bodies in the mirror. Really? Yes. They never talked to us like that, but there was these talks about, like, you know, no pornography, no, like, oh, you yeah. knew and you were shamed for just like that. Like, you can't wear, like, even your clothing had something to do with, like, your being impure, like, by dressing a certain way. Yeah, we were definitely, that was one thing that LDS, like, that our modesty was definitely encouraged to help the boys. Like, it was always about making sure that the men didn't have impure thoughts, mm. which is, like, that's definitely <laughs> one so thing. so anti that. I know, right? You know, because as, as if men don't have control, right? Why would I <laughs> want to marry a man who can't even control his thoughts because of what a woman's wearing? Like, yeah. and have children with that. Yeah, we're, no. we're setting the bar so low. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, you know, I, I said that I was LDS yeah. a little bit for a couple of months. The breaking point was the clothing for me. Oh. Because I was like, this is too close to home. I am out. And Temple it was, garments or what? No, just the, like, no shoulders showing. And there was a talk. One of the elders got up and was like, if a woman dresses, like, inappropriate, she is walking pornography. She is the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. literally in the LDS church. It, it went viral on TikTok. <laughs> yes, it did. Um... But that talk specifically was a trigger for me, and I was like, nope. Mm -hmm. And I get, like, you don't walk down the street naked. There's, there's like, obvious <laughs> things, but there's also, like, if it's more of an internal thing. If you if you feel like someone's dressing a certain way to affect you, that's that's your problem. <laughs> you yeah, know? Like, yeah, like we said, you're triggered by what's inside of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing for me as well, like, I've, I've realized when I have the freedom to choose, I choose mm -hmm. to dress the way I want. Yeah. And it's not provocative. And if I choose to be, I can. I'm still going to go wear a bikini at the pool. It's not going to be a big deal. I'll still mm -hmm. wear it on the beach, whatever. It's about your, what it's you about, want, not yeah. what everyone else wants. It's about inside, and it's because you are self-validated by yourself. Mm -hmm. Was the garments a hard thing for you? Um, no, I grew up being so strict with my modesty. So a lot of girls, like before you go through the temple... You know, we're told, like, no bikinis, no short shorts, but a lot of girls still would, and it just wasn't as big of a deal. I mean, 
It was like you'd look at them with a scale of like how righteous you were for sure. So you had like the girls who would still wear bikinis and still wear short shorts. And you're like, okay, they're not as righteous as it, the girls who are wearing the Bermuda mm-hmm. shorts and the cap <laughs> sleeves, right? But at the end of the day, both could be married in the temple because you weren't wearing your garments yet. I was such a good girl that I made a goal to only wear clothes like through high school and stuff that I could wear garments with so that it wouldn't be as hard of an adjustment. And that's Mm -hmm. how like my mom was like, if you just start wearing clothes now like it, it's not going to be this huge adjustment. You're not going to hate them because you'll have always dressed like that. And so Mm -hmm. it's not going to be a big deal. And so that was where I was. Like when I got married, I had to throw out maybe a handful of clothes and that was it. That like my garments wouldn't work with. So, um, garments weren't a huge deal other than it just added a layer in St. George, which was really hot. Oh, yeah. But because I was fully believing in the reasons for it too, like they were sacred and I, yeah, I really enjoyed wearing garments until I realized that I didn't believe in the covenants that they represented. And then my reason for taking off garments, cause I, I know that it's like hard for some people that are like, well, you know, you're not listening to your cut or your, uh, going against your covenants and stuff. I'm like, more than going against covenants, for me, it felt disrespectful. Really? If I don't, if I don't believe in the temple ordinances, then... Why should I be wearing them? Then this? if I wear mm-hmm. them, it's not dis- more disrespectful to wear them when I don't believe in them than to continue to wear them out of um, tradition mm-hmm. and treat them as actual just underwear. Yeah. That's and to me, point. that felt more disrespectful to the religion. And so that was more of why I took them off, not out of a comfort reason... Because it did feel a little bit uncomfortable at first to not have them. Mm -hmm. Um, And you get a lot more wedgies. So (laughs) So I actually hear they're really comfortable. They are. They are because they're like biker shorts, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like just always having an undershirt on. So no, the comfort like is definitely there. Sorry, random fact. But Mm -hmm. yeah, so for me, it's like not. Have you seen the LDS garments? You mean FLDS? I'm sorry, the FLDS. No, someone does. I was like, what's that about? No, but th- someone did ask that question if we were comfortable talking about that. So if you want to tell, because you, did you guys have garments at all? Only ever? when we die. Only, only when we're buried, hmm. if we were like a worthy order member, we would get buried in garments. And I didn't even know this till I got older, but there was also a, um, a young girl who committed suicide at 15 and be- because that's like a big sin, yeah. right? They like put the garments on her, but they put them on her in a different way as some type of a weird ritual I don't know. Huh. I think there's even secrets in the group that even members don't even know about. Did they wear... Okay, um, when we saw... Who was it? We... Oh, I know what it was. It was at an FLDS funeral, mm-hmm. and they wore temple clothing to be buried in, which is typical. So when you get... Um, if you've been through the temple in LDS, you get buried in your temple clothing and, like, your full temple ritual clothing. And you have, like, a sash as well. Like, a green really? apron. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can look it up on LDS.org. We are not being disrespectful in any way. Go look it up if you want to see the, the, the temple clothing, just so you know. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, the actual temple with the, the apron and everything. as well. Okay, so did they wear that in for their temple rituals as well or just for the burial? Because when I looked at it, I was like, I guarantee they got this from Deseret Book. Like, I guarantee they I got it from I actually have no idea because I never went to the temple. Oh, okay. And a lot of people, uh, the older, a lot of older, older people did back in the day and then the temple was built in Texas in 08. Oh, okay. But a lot of, like, when they were buried, they had, like, a green sash and that meant that you were, like, had done your temple ordinances It's or like whatever. getting a black belt in religion, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of. But I think that was <laughs> it. That, that was kind of it. I don't know if they ever wore it in because you had to wear complete white. Oh, okay. Like, like everything has to be white when you... So, and when you're talking about the garments, are I'm you wondering talking about the undergarments? Undergarments. Or the underwear? Okay. Undergarments, yep. So not the temple clothes on top. I'm wondering, though, if they got the garments from the LDS church because I found out later that there were some members secretly going to the LDS church, and I'm wondering... So they could if have access was, to them? I'm wondering if there's still some overlying things that they believe that the LDS... I don't know. Well, like the FLDS, like, they still get, like, their hymn books and mm-hmm. their Our hymn books were the green ones, right? Yeah, the green ones mm-hmm. from the LDS church. And um, when Sam told me that, I was like, okay, so they're going in and, like, using the same resources basically right. which I thought was really interesting but which, yeah which makes me wonder that maybe those garments are not far off of the LDS ones yeah but then you didn't have to wear garments as kids because no. Joanna wore mm-hmm. garments as children we, we wore anything. them for as long as I can remember and they were a lot different they were always cotton it was like oh. a jumpsuit so they went to your wrists to your neckline and to your ankles so that was under the dress at all times yes well wow. and that is what Joseph Smith revealed Really? And yes, then they the have like a cutout garments. around like your 
private areas. Right? Private areas. Go to the you to use the restroom, kind of like open, like chaps, I guess, in mm-hmm. the back. But it was all it was it was in one piece, and they could not touch the floor ever. That is what we were talking about. How are you supposed to change? You stood up and did it. You held it. You put your legs in. You. Yeah, yeah. like as little floor contact, and the other and you were couldn't told that as lay well, a towel like down either. You couldn't lay a towel down. Do it on top of the towel. That was bad. Oh. What? <laughs> That must have been really and, awkward. Yeah, <laughs> do all the time, every day. Honestly, yeah. it was normal. Like we wore uh, the garments, the leggings, the bra. That's true. Panties, when it's a normal silk thing, slip, and then the pride dress. Mm, then it's normal. There's yeah. no other way to do it. So it's like I didn't. This is all I know. <laughs> yeah. But for me, I was like, I thought garments were so weird because we never wore them, and I even thought it was weird that we were buried in them. I'm like, why does it matter? Like, is it gonna? Why magically... does it matter now? Yeah, it's over now, right? Yeah. The LDS garments were way more comfortable. Like they continued like. Uh, it was right after I had been endowed that they went from having like the high waist to where they did hip hugger ones. Like they continually change them, and even now, like they've gotten like shorter and shorter. So now you can wear like mm-hmm. not short shorts, but like a regular length short. You can wear them. And Isn't the there... cap sleeve has gone from where it was like there was cloth underneath your arm and on top of your arm. They got rid of the under part because you would sweat in it and be annoying, right? Yeah. But now it's like barely covers your shoulder. Like they've changed them so much. That's another thing. Like. Um, I'm like, well, we'll see where that ends up going if they end up yep. being tank tops someday <laughs> because <laughs> for like comfort reasons, honestly, I don't even right. mean that disrespectfully. Like I think they'll continue. If you look at where they started to where they are now, people would be rolling over in their graves thinking that we were wearing these ones now thinking that we were modest. Yeah, they would. They would be mm-hmm. rolling over being like, that's not modest. And that is not what Joseph Smith, I mean, Joseph Smith. And I did a lot of research into this when we were looking into stuff, but what the FLDS wear is more exactly how it was revealed and joseph smith said when it was revealed because he saw an angel like appeared to him and showed him the garments exactly how they were meant to be and he said if these garments are ever changed it will be blasphemy wow that's what we believed as well and they buttoned up in the front like like i said everything you couldn't let them show it all so it was absolute blasphemy for them to ever be changed and that was one thing that was again one more thing that i'm like Here's the pass list. It's blasphemy if it gets changed. Here's my list. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's crazy that we never even heard of it, and it was something that Joe, because we believed in Joseph Smith. Yeah. Weird. Huh. But again, if you don't have like active temples, I can see where. You There's no have point that. in it, right? Because originally garments weren't meant to be worn outside the temple. Okay, yeah. So that's it's probably so weird to me. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Joseph Smith, when he originally revealed the, it was a, called the temple garment, and it was something that you only wore in, in the, the temple. temple. Okay. And then yeah. from oh my. My sound going down. Hello. Check. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but it was something, so you originally only wore it in the temple. And then um, from the research I did, they said then some people started wearing it outside the temple to show that they were righteous enough to be in the temple. So it started being a status symbol of like, I'm not just wearing this in the temple. I'm wearing it all the time. They originally had little collars on it. Mm-hmm. And so they said like the women would let the collar of the garment come outside of the top of their dress as a way to prove that they were so righteous that they had the temple garment and they were going to wear it all the time instead of just when they had to as a sign of righteousness. So because... the temple garment and the way that it's changed and like progressed over time has been very, very like, go research that on your own time. There's lots of information on LDS.org mm-hmm. about it. Um, well, actually, it was kind of harder to find. The When I, on LDS.org, I went and found some other resources and then I had, my brother was going to BYU at the time. Mm-hmm. And I said, This is what I've been able to find. It was hard to find on the church website. Can you go and confirm that what I found is correct? And he went to his BYU religion professor and was like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. So it was a little bit harder to find. Um, But very, very interesting stuff that I think has changed. It's all. I feel like I want to research it more now because I don't, I have no idea on any of it. (laughs) Any of it. Yeah. But I'm just saying if like, if from your split off, you didn't have temples, it would make sense that you wouldn't have the temple garment. Mm -hmm. So. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. I see How many time. more do you think you want? We should do. Let's, let's do <laughs> two more. I think a lot of these. Um, oh, this is a good one. I want to ask this real quick to you guys because I'm not as familiar with this. Um, oh, see, someone asked about endowments. We kind of went over that. Generally, when a woman gets married, she takes the man's last name in regards to polygamy. Since many of the plural wives aren't legally married, will they keep their maiden name or do they change their last name? You want to go first? <laughs> For us in the church, you changed your name. Every time? In the church, yes. Okay, in the church, but legally, that would have been expensive. Legally, no. <laughs> legally, no, but so in the church, mean, like, 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 yes, Let's say someone do. marries a Jessup, then er- all the wives, let's say he has 10 wives, all the wives are known as Jessup now. Yes. Mm, okay. 
Not for us. We, my mom is a second wife, so she would not take on the first. So I would be Johnson if I took my dad's last name. But because my mom was not the first wife, the first wife took the last name because that's the legal one. And then they spiritually got married. And my mom literally went in, went with my birth certificate. It says I, my father's name is Kyle Grant and I'm Amanda Grant. Grant is a fake last name. And they did that with, it's just tradition now, but I think that the reason was because they were so afraid of getting prosecuted for living polygamy, even though no one, no one that I know of has been prosecuted, you know? I honestly almost feel like it's partially in their favor so they don't, the men never have to pay child support. The women can get food stamps and WIC and, mm-hmm. and all this financial help. So, uh, yeah, so my mom's last name, Grant, the, the third wife's last name, completely like just made up names. And that's why it's like sometimes it was so hard to even know, oh, you're my cousin through these people because the names were all so fake. Everything was fake. (laughs) That's so, that would be so hard to track down like lineage, Mm -hmm. which I know you had shared before that like you didn't even know who your father was until you were older, right? Oh, they, they, because (coughs) my mom was the second wife, um, I didn't get like the luxury, I guess, of knowing who my dad was. I literally asked him, I was like, are you my dad? I was, I think I was like five and he was like, no. Well, then who is? <laughs> Where's Kyle Grant? I don't know where he's at. But they, the, the state found a Kyle Grant and demanded like child support from him. And, and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So it's very illegal to be doing that. Yeah. But, um, no, for us, like, so my mom was married to a Fisher. She changed her name to Fisher because she was his first and only wife. Mm-hmm. She had six kids. And then she remarried her sister's husband, who was a Barlow. So in the religion, we all switched our names to Barlow. I was raised as Barlow in the religion so is your last name on your birth certificate What's it's fisher oh, okay okay huh that's interesting i guess too like the reason i knew that i was related to some flds though is because my dad's johnson name his mom was a sixth wife of the leader ortel and she actually did come do you know who price johnson is yes that's I my do. posterity yeah but- he's uh, leroy johnson's brother mm-hmm. i think so, and Leroy Johnson was a prophet that's what, in our cult. what made me believe that, that we were all one cult at one time just because of that. But I think maybe it was like maybe people just leaving the FLDS coming here. But so because she kept her last name, which is rare for the women to keep their maiden names, they'll change it. I don't know why, but she yeah. kept her Johnson name, which made me be like, oh, I guess I have Johnson lineage. I might even be related to you somehow. Probably are. <laughs> uh, my grandma, Grandma Jenny Johnson is a Johnson. So yes. So we're probably like second probably. or third cousins. Um, another thing is like the, my mom had two siblings from the Barlow guy and they took the Barlow name. So mm-hmm. legally he is their father on their birth certificate and she is not his legal wife. Wow. So that's it's a little crazy. different. That's way different than LDS, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, we just normal, normal. birth certificate. You know who your dad is. <laughs> no <We> lying. <laughs> you knew who your dad was though, right? Yes, I always did. Uh, I always knew his name, but I did not know what he looked like clear until I was older. And the first time I actually talked to him and knew he was my dad, I was 16. Wow. And I Did called you... him, and I was like, hey, I'm your daughter, Joanna. And he said, Joanna who? And hung up the phone. What? Why? I don't know. I think he was, it was at night, and I think he was tired, and and he hadn't talked to me. What, like, did he not live in your same home? No, no, he was kicked out. Oh, that's right. He was right. sent okay. to go repent, and on my brother's funeral when I was nine, he came through the line, and I didn't know he was my dad. I hugged him, and I had no idea that was my dad. Wow. Mm. That's crazy. That's one thing that's different is we never, the fathers never got sent away. And the fathers, like when you're a numbered man, you're a numbered man. Usually that, that's like you're... No, everybody got kicked out. Yeah, that's pretty The higher you awesome. were up, like if you knew more things, you did one bad thing and you were out. Of course, wow. your prophet isn't in jail though, right? Not yet. Just kidding. <laughs> no, yeah, ours um, is in jail for life in so 20 years. I'm just like, saying. He, he doesn't really have anyone to threat. He doesn't have... Um, the threat to his power, the mm-hmm. way that Warren did when he started kicking out oh, people, right? Maybe that's what it is. Because yeah. if he's still in power and everything's still running the way he wants, then he doesn't really need to kick out the other men for any type of advantages, right? Right. But it's also, I think, um, he he did it in his own way where he would he would like get pay cuts to the people that are like less, um, maybe like like my mom. She's uh, kind of a burden on the order at this point now because the family is like a tainted name. So it's almost like she gets demoted every year. And it's mm. like, they're not going to kick her out, but they're not going to like, please stay here, you know? Yeah. So it's an interesting line of doing things, I guess. Okay, I will keep it to two more questions. I was trying to scroll through, so I wasn't trying to be rude not looking while you guys were saying this, but... Um, do, do, do. Each of your views on men while you were in the church versus your view on men now. 
Hmm. I feel like my journey was really like long for and I'm still going through this I definitely when I first left I went through like a man hating period (laughs) I did the same thing I went Mm. through a period where I was like men just want control men just want everything Mm. and they did where I came from I mean I don't think they actually did themselves but they were taught that way so even my ex he was very controlling Mm -hmm. for years it took him so long I mean even wearing short sleeves he didn't want me to at first and then Mm. I broke out and we changed so much but for him it was easier because men have all the control but they're taught that way Yep. It's not like they choose to be that way. Right. And that's the thing is I I took a long time to figure this out, but it's like the order breeds narcissistic men and that's very normal. And we were like worshiping that. And then it goes along the lines of where we run to the red flags, right? Narcissistic men is all we knew. So we get in relationships with them. And so then it made me be like, oh man, you're trash. (laughs) All just want to control me. No, it's like the relationship I'm in now. Like I'll do something and expect a reaction and then I don't get that reaction. And I'm like, do you love me? Like you're not Mm -hmm. reacting uh, toxically like I'm used to because you associate love with toxicity. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I went through that whole phase of like, uh, I I was scared to say things because I'm like, this is usually something that would trigger all the narcissistic men in my life. Mm. So then when they're not triggered, I'm like, do they just not care about me? Yeah. But it sucks because then it's like you have to, how do you take that out of your brain and be like, that's not love. (laughs) I guess the one thing that made it healthy for me is like, I guess uh, when I would get angry about things that he did, he'd be like, you're angry because you chose to be. Not because I made you angry. I did that. You chose to be angry because of it. And so like he was like, if you do something and I get angry, it's not your fault that I got angry. It's mine. It's my choice to get angry. Two separate events. That's true. It gives it gives that power back to you. Your emotions are yours and not anyone else's responsibility. Exactly. And in a relationship even, it works healthy like that. But it took me a long time when he didn't react, I would get heartbroken because mm-hmm. he didn't love me. When in reality, he was like, I don't react because I love you. Yeah. It's healthy to actually not get mad about everything the person does. Yeah. And I, control I it. <laughs> yeah. You never went through the daddy issue phase. I never went through the daddy issue phase. <laughs> Lucky you. I, would, I know. <laughs> sorry. I will say the only thing that made me think like while you guys were talking is on the other side, Sam, people get the, like we get the question all the time, like how did Sam overcome growing up like that and then mm-hmm. not turning into that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I always tell people, so I'll just say this one little thing about him is that He always says, like, no matter where you grew up, no matter what your upbringing is like, you can always look at the examples in your life and you can say, that's what I want or that's what I don't want. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and so he goes, it didn't take long after leaving where I was seeing these happy, successful, good relationships and to realize that's what I want and what I grew up with and what I saw is not what I want. And he was like, all you can say is that looking towards that he knew that that's what he wanted to be and by the time we had like met and started dating seriously well we had met when we were 18 but when we started dating when we were 23 he said like it took him a little while to realize but it doesn't actually take that long to realize how to treat someone well Mm -hmm. if that's what your heart wants yeah that's that's what manti said as well because he is from there he's from the mm -hmm. same religion as me yeah he was never controlling but his first relationship he was and he says he was toxic yeah, but that takes a lot to he's admit. Changed. Mm-hmm. But admitting that, and I even admit mm-hmm. that I was toxic in my first relationship. Mm-hmm. I was very toxic and manipulative towards the end because it felt like I. I feel like um, when you're in a toxic relationship, you can't just say that the other person was the only toxic because you were in it for however long. So you if you don't to get out, right? <laughs> if you don't get out in the beginning, you become toxic, and by the end, you don't know who is the victim and yeah. who is more toxic. I think that's right. But if everybody you, has the opportunity to be able to change and to be mm-hmm. able to, like, be a good partner for someone else. If you're willing to look at those things and work on yourself and be saying, okay, I want better, and you can, you know. Yes, mm-hmm. but I, like, I do believe it better. does It does start with taking responsibility and being, like, recognizing yep. exactly. that you were toxic and being like, okay, taking, I don't want that anymore. Like Sam mm-hmm, said, yeah. this is what I want. This is what I'm going to pursue. This is how I get there. Yep. Yeah, I always joke with Sam that, like, all, most of his brothers that have left have ended up with, like, really strong-willed women. <laughs> really? And I was like, I think all of them left, and they were like, oh, no, we're used to that. Let's take on a challenge. Yeah. Like, <laughs> let's have someone who's going to, like, push us and stuff. Because, yeah, like, all of us are pretty, like, strong-willed women. So I think but it's But I think funny. that's attractive, too, to have someone that knows what they want. They know where they're going, you know. Yeah, so it's interesting that that, that happened. But, yeah, too. but they're all, like, happy and in, like good, healthy relationships they when they seem like, like that. that. Yes, they are they all are. like that. Yeah. So anyway, for those of you who are like, oh, if the men leave, can they ever get better? They can. They can mm-hmm. choose as well. And they are not some thoughtless creatures. You don't have any control over their thoughts. Or no, they do. Mm-hmm. That is well, not everybody, <laughs> everybody can choose to change. Everybody can choose. And I, I don't, I, I'd always say transform. 
because that's the truth but you awaken to those problems and then you transform from those problems Mm -hmm. but it takes uh, awakening and realizing just taking responsibility for the part that you play yep and definitely moving on from it forgiving yourself is the biggest thing if you do Mm -hmm. not forgive yourself you will continue to be toxic you will because you'll bring that back into your life because you create that yeah i think that taking the responsibility thing too and not not pointing out everything else externally because then you're giving the control to the external things that you can't control take it and point internally to the things you can control and change that absolutely yeah yeah okay i'm just gonna end on this one and it's so fun we could probably we could literally be in here for hours (laughs) but um (laughs) i say in here like we're locked up or something we're just in the room but anyway um (laughs) Do you, and I just thought this was sweet, and also, I kind of guess I'll ask two questions. The question says, do you girls realize that if you inspire one woman to leave, you're changing a whole generation? I guess I know, I don't really think of it like that. I guess I look at it like that for me, like, wow, I could have stayed and had, like, 10 kids there and, and had, like, a terrible life for those kids, and I stopped that. But I look at, I guess, um, maybe it still is a whiplash for me because I – some people will message me and be like, you changed this. You made me see the truth, da, da, da. But I'm like, you chose to listen. So it's really you that did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess that question is overwhelming because my intent in sharing my story is to let women know that there are other options. But like she said, it's up to them if they take those options. Mm-hmm. If you could, and this is where my last little question is going to be, like if you could say one thing to someone who is still in – your religion or cult like what would you say to them if they were starting to watch and they're just barely starting to feel comfortable watching what's one thing you'd want to say i used to have the same thing because i would ask people this question and i liked hearing their answers and my answer was always question everything until it makes sense but i think it's changed now to um find out who you are like ask yourself like if you're what you're doing every day is it for you or is it for everybody else are you living your life for you or are you living your life for everyone else and it really should be for you because you're not living your mom's life, your dad's life, your brother. You're living your life. Yeah, so. that's a good one. Joanna? I think I would say trust the process. Mm-hmm. Um, learn to forgive. Forgive lets you off the hook. Because if you're one. still angry, mm-hmm. they still have control. It's so true. even like me, I don't, I'm not angry. I mean, I was angry for a long time at Warren Jeffs. I am mm-hmm. not anymore because it doesn't affect my life anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think trust the process of getting out. Trust the process and accept help, please. (laughs) Do not be too proud because I was that proud kid that was like, I don't need anybody's help. The only thing Mm -hmm. I'm going to accept help in is education. And then you just make it harder on yourself. (laughs) Exactly. So accept help, be appreciative, have gratitude, and don't hate your past because Mm -hmm. it's a part of you. Celebrate it. Yep. Celebrate that you learn from that. Yeah. But trust the process and forgive. Forgive, first of all, yourself. And forgive people that have lied to you because if you don't, they will continue to control your yep. life and your attitude still, on your look of life. You're still giving them the power, yeah, for yeah. sure. What about you? <laughs> I would say um, to not fear truth or to not think that there isn't such a thing as truth. Like there are some things that can actually be true or not true. Mm-hmm. Um, And then I would say to never try to compare your journey to anybody else's or expect your journey to end up a certain place. I think it's easy, especially within the LDS, you know, a lot of people might not have the same traumatic things, Mm -hmm. but still at the end of the day, like when you're starting to have questions or doubts, you'll like compare yourself to that one person who left and you think, okay, is my journey going to end up there? Is my journey going to end up here? And when you worry about where the ending is, it's hard for you to just actually be able to fully experience your own spiritual journey. Yep. I think I'm going through that a little bit right now. Like how I keep being like, I'm 26 and it took me this long. Like I keep comparing myself to where I should be and it makes it harder to just live in the experiences right now. And to not be like, yeah, and let go of the expectation of this is where I have to end up or this is where I'm going to end up and fully be present in the moment to take in how you're feeling and know that You don't have to rush through it. It's not a time limit. It's not, I think that's something else that like growing up, you feel like you have to have it all together all Mm -hmm. the time and you have to know everything all the time. And I remember when we first started going through like our journey, I felt like, well, if this isn't true, I have to find this other truth somewhere else, you know, like, like a religion or something like that. Like just trusting yourself in your process, I guess, and not Mm -hmm. feeling like you have to know the ending before you get there. Yeah. Yeah. I would say also be happy where you're at. If your happiness depends on, you know, finding out all the truths about it, you're never going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So live like Melissa said now, 
-hmm. be happy now it's just a choice it and it, yeah, it's not really necessarily about the end goal, too. It's really about the process and the journey, too. Cause yeah. We're all going to die one day. <laughs> you, you never, <laughs> you never have. <laughs> it's actually kind of, yeah, like all of life, really, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like You never have true. what you continue to chase. You continue to chase, you never have. It's true. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. So well, um, I, I want to, uh, what was your channel called? Amanda Ray. It's just my name. Okay. <laughs> yep. Look up Amanda Ray. I will leave links below. Joanna will do your Instagram until yes. we... And let me know too if I would love to do like another yeah, what's, episode like what's this. Yeah, what's your Instagram? Yeah. I want to. Follow me. I'll follow you back. Or... Perfect. Perfect. And I will leave links below to Amanda's channel, Joanna's Instagram. Um, if you want to keep hearing what it was like for not only Sam, who we didn't even include this time. Yeah. Get him a, yeah. He yeah. bring us the coffee, he though. He, yes. he did bring he us the coffee. <laughs> so thank you for that, honey. But um, if you want to hear more what it was like, not just for him, but for other people, what it was like for them to grow up in polygamy and to move on and move forward past that, then please like and subscribe to us and Amanda. Find Joanna. And we're just grateful for all of you. Yes, thank you, guys. We'll talk to y'all later. <laughs> Bye.